I'd like to introduce the fourth panel today uh, called Ethical Issues and COVID-19. The moderator for that panel is Dr. William Parker, uh, who's an assistant professor of pulmonary and critical care, as well as an assistant director of the McLean Center. Dr. Parker's research interests include the impact of organ allocation policies on patients and transplant programs. His overall career goal is to apply advanced data science methods, such as deep learning, to organ allocation and design systems that efficiently and fairly allocate these scarce healthcare resources, organ transplants, to the patients most in need. Recently, Dr. Parker received a K award from the National Heart, Blood, and Lung Institute to develop a novel heart allocation system using data analytics and artificial intelligence. In addition to moderating today's second panel on ethical issues in COVID-19, Dr. Parker will give the first talk entitled Simulating Scarce Healthcare Resource Allocation Systems Bringing Data to Debate. The other speakers in the fourth panel will include John LaPuma, Alexia Torki, and Anoop Malani. Please join me in welcoming the moderator, Dr. Will Parker. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Siegler. Um, you know, you, you promoted me a little bit early. I'm still instructor of medicine until the end of the year, but um, since I've known you, I guess only for 30% of my life in the percentage of life, someone has known Dr. Siegler, you've been promoting me that entire time. So it's a huge honor uh, to be moderating this session and be, to be giving a talk here at the McLean Conference. Um, so I, I think I should just jump right in. I have a lot of content I wanted to get through today. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today are crisis. Oh, first I should mention my K08, which Mark already outlined, um, is my only disclosure. So I'm going to talk about crisis standards of care today. And well, what are these? Um, this is the Memorial Hospital in New Orleans. Um, as you can see, it was completely flooded by Hurricane Katrina. Uh, temperatures inside the hospital reached 100 degrees at, the, at its peak. Uh, they were without power for days as the patients slowly started to die because of lack of medical care. The physicians inside had to make the tragic choice of deciding which patients would receive critical care and which would be made comfortable. Because of this crisis and several others, the Institute of Medicine formally defined the crisis of standards of care as a substantial change in usual healthcare operations uh, that, that is possible to deliver. So when a disaster hits and it's no longer possible to provide all patients that they need the care that they need, this is a situ these are situations of what's called absolute scarcity, where the flood of patients that need critical care or healthcare resources in general vastly exceeds the amount of uh, available care. And fortunately, during the first surge in the U.S., we largely avoided absolute scarcity. There was lots of regional disparities in care, but the healthcare system was able to handle the load. Um, unfortunately, now with the current trends in the COVID-19 pandemic, we may very well hit a scenario where in major U.S. cities across the country, there are just simply too many patients. And what would this look like? Um, you, you'd imagine scenarios like this playing out across the, across the U.S. where there are three patients in one remaining ICU bed. Um, and you have the physicians at the hospital have to somehow decide who is going to get critical care treatment and which patients are going to be assigned palliative care and presumably die shortly thereafter because they will not be receiving life support that they desperately need at that time as the COVID-19 infection progresses. Um, so, you know, you would have imagine that they'd have demographic information about each of these patients, age, gender, and then you'd have some prediction of survival you could make based on their clinical data. Here is the sequential organ failure assessment score, SOFA score, which I'll be describing in more detail later on, that give you a rough prediction um, of what their probability of surviving their hospital stay is. Then you also have other information about their medical condition. And finally, social factors, which I think most of us would think it would be unethical to base an, al an objective allocation system on. However, if you didn't have an allocation system in place, may actually dominate 
how scarce resources are, would be allocated in practice. Um, so Andrew Hantel this morning in his wonderful talk on his allocation work already outlined this great paper by Jibin Prasad in The Lancet in 2009. Uh, where it, he, he develops a rich framework of all the possible principles one could use to allocate scarce resources. Roughly, there's four big categories, treating people equally, utilitarianism, treating the worse off, and promoting or rewarding social usefulness. Now, I'm not going to go into the merits, the pros and cons of each of those at great length. I would refer you to this paper. But the important conclusion from that uh, work is that you can't put all your eggs in one basket. You have to construct a multi-principle framework and all and draw each of these principles should be respected in one way or the other uh, in order to provide to create a rich uh, robust framework that will be acceptable to all stakeholders in the process but i i would say that the the problem goes further than that um oh i i just want to say that they did update their framework for the COVID 19 pandemic uh, this is Zeke Emanuel is the first author in this paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. So you can see the framework is roughly the same in terms of the principles that they refer to and the recommendations. However, all the authors were 10 years older. So prioritizing younger patients first kind of went, fell to the bottom of the list. So I don't know if that was a coincidence or not, but before it was heavily um, emphasized in their first framework. So, you know, what are the general points of consensus amongst ethicists about how you would allocate resources in this terrible situation where you have to make these tragic choices. Well, first come, first serve is not acceptable. You have if if you relied on that sort of status quo system, the well connected and well off would clearly cut the line and get uh, critical care first. So you can't rely on that system. And then triage committees, not frontline providers, not people uh, ra uh, shouldn't be rationing at the bedside to use that. Well, should be making triage committee uh, decisions. And how, how should these committees make decide who's going to get resources, uh, critical care resources, ventilators, et cetera? Well, objective scores and algorithms designed to maximize benefits to the population should be employed. Um, however, we are already run into a problem, right? What, what is a benefit to the population? Um, should these scores maximize the total number of lives saved or the total number of life years saved? Um, so if we go back to our example of the three patients deciding who gets the one ICU bed remaining, if you're allocating based on survival to hospital discharge, the older patient, the 80-year-old patient in our example, would, would sort of win the, the uh, rationing process and go to the ICU. However, you're allocating based on potential future life expectancy. Um, so if you multiply the probability of survival by remaining life years, the 28-year-old the patient, even though she's much sicker, would uh, be allocated critical care resources first. So what this example highlights is that you can have a very well thought out and rich normative ethical framework, but when you de design a practical allocation protocol, you have to make real choices, which actually impl um, will influence how those different uh, principles that you've laid on your framework are weighed relative to one another. And so how have states started to do this? Well. The answer is a lot haven't um, in this great work by Dr. Pisicello from Rush, another McLean fellow. Uh, she found that only 28 states even had a, a, a implemented a crisis standard of care in their state. And the guidance documents varied widely state to state. You know, the first time Gina made this figure, basically every state was its own color because each of these protocols is materially different in the way they rank order patients in the, in the setting of a scarce uh, condition, uh, uh, an absolute scarcity. And but most of them use rely on uh, objective measurements of in hospital mortality as their primary way of rank ordering patients, like the sequential organ failure assessment score. So this is something that we can calculate at the bedside. Uh, it's actually fairly accurate in terms of predicting uh, in hospital mortality. So we can discriminate in, in, in theory between patients. Um, and this is true in COVID-19 patients as well. Who will, who will uh, survive from or, or die if assigned to critical care. And so most states hang their hat on the SOFA score, but the way they use the scope, SOFA score varies dramatically. So in New York, they have certain cutoffs where if your SOFA score is over 11, you're not allocated by ICU resources, a ventilator in, under any circumstances. You're given sort of a blue armband in the mili military triage literature. Um, whereas Pennsylvania has totally different cutoffs, much lower uh, threshold to get into that top priority score one 
of a SOFA score of less than six, and they incorporate explicit chronic disease points, which are designed to identify patients who have the longest life expectancy and deprioritize patients who are expected to die soon, regardless of their COVID-19 diagnosis. And they, the examples they use for these chronic condition points have actually now been removed from the state website because of various ch uh, legal challenges and general outcry that these potentially would uh, perpetuate disparities against people with disabilities in particular. But it kind of goes further than that, which in terms of racial and ethnic disparities. So here's an example of a 40 year old patient who's on dialysis under the Pennsylvania system, they would be prioritized lower than an 80 year old patient who had a much higher risk of death with no chronic medical conditions. Um, so, you know, just simple application of these scores to real patients, real data produces a lot of surprising results. Um, and, you know, the, the concern that we had, uh, you know, Monica Peake, who spoke wonderfully this morning about this issue in a larger context, is that if you actually had to implement one of these crisis standard of care in a diverse urban population, you would end up exacerbating uh, cr the chronic disp disparities that we've seen um, in the COVID-19 pandemic. It would make the allocation of ICU resources to minority communities even lower than they already are. And Maryland is another example of a state protocol which divides up the SOFA score in a different metric. And so the main point of me showing you this is that every state has their own way to cut the SOFA score up into different categories and translate the SOFA score into a numerical score that they're going to rank order patients by. And then furthermore, if two patients have the same score, the way they break the ties between each state also varies widely. A lot of um, the green here is not mentioned, so they don't have a, a plan for that situation. Um, but you know, some just use a peer lottery, others use an age tiebreaker, which is important to remember as I actually start showing you some of the data. So um, basically the conclusions from our review of the state protocols is that there's total lack of consistency all the, the components of the protocols vary, even though, you know, they all are kind of drawing from the same general ethical framework that, you know, you want to try to maximize the benefits of the populations. The way that's implemented varies widely across the country in meaningful, practical ways. And, you know, what, what a lot of us started thinking about is, you know, what if we apply these protocols to real data and actually simulate how they would perform? Maybe that would inform some of these choices. So, um, through the McLean Center and connections therein. Uh, you'll see many authors like Kelly Mickelson, uh, Monica Peake on this paper, um, who, which is now, hopefully will get accepted fairly soon, decided to do just that. Let's take these protocols, let's take real data from COVID patients and see how they would perform under a hypothetical allocation um, scarcity scenario. So we got the, all of the data of all the COVID, patient, COVID positive patients admitted to the ICU at University of Chicago and Northwestern, as well as the Northwestern affiliates. Um, if you look closely at this table, you can probably figure out which column is U of C and which column is Northwestern. Um, the patients at U of C tended to be more, were predominantly African American and had higher SOFA scores on presentations, who were more critically ill when they arrived at the hospital than those at Northwestern or the Northwestern Community Hospitals. But all these patients were sick. They were all requiring critical care resources immediately and all would have died without critical care. Um, and so basically what we did is apply the ranking systems, all those three state protocols I outlined earlier, as well as some pragmatic ones. Sick is first, not, not as a serious um, um, thing that we're proposing, but sort of showing how bad things could be if we assign the highest SOFA score first. How would um, <clears throat> how would that how badly would that perform in terms of saving lives? Um, because that's you're giving ICU resources to the sickest patients, those least likely to survive with ICU care. Lottery is random, and youngest versus uh, the youngest go first. Pretty straightforward. And then the rest are the complicated priority scores uh, New, uh, that New York and Maryland and Pennsylvania came up with. Um, and so, if you look at the distribution of priority scores, I want you to remember this when I show you some results at the end. You see, what, what jumped out to us right away is that a, a big clumping in the top priority tier. So most patients in the New York system would be red, meaning that they would be you know, top priority for the ICU. But when 70 patients are top priority for the ICU, the system is more or less kind of operating like a lottery, right? Very few patients are getting excluded based on their SOFA score. Maryland was even more extreme because it has a higher SOFA score cutoff. So what, what are we doing with the simulation modeling? Well, what we're doing is we have a, a sample of 1,000 patients. 
We randomly draw uh, with replacement a brand new sample uh, from that from that from that data. Apply the allocation rule. And then, so so fifty, or assuming a fifty percent scarcity, we assign fifty percent of the patients to palliative care who will who will die, and the other fifty percent will get critical care. And then, amongst those who are assigned critical care, those that we calculate the survival from their actual observed outcomes. So it's this. This is obviously completely hypothetical, where we could put all the patients in Chicago in one bucket and allocate all at once. Nevertheless, um, we thought it was a good first approximation of the way these allocation rules would perform. Um, and so these are the these are the main results. Um, so fifty percent scarcity threshold here. So the protocols could per, could save at most fifty percent of the patients, right? Because that's all the critical care resources we had available. And as you see, the sickest first, as expected, performed the worst. Those you're assigning critical care to patients giving ICU care to patients with the highest SOFA score and the highest chance of death. So that makes sense. It's sort of a sanity check that SOFA works at all. Lottery improves that significantly among over a sickest first. And then the state protocols get you more lives saved uh, per, you know, so pretty significant five per 100 lives saved. Uh, however, these the state protocols achieve this increased efficiency at a cost to patients with severe and chronic or major and chronic conditions. So if you had a major chronic con or severe condition in the Pennsylvania system, none of those patients were allocated critical care resources. And the same goes for patients with severe critical care or severe chronic uh, conditions in the Maryland system. So, can, you know, I don't think the people who designed these systems intended them to be completely exclusionary of patients with pre-existing medical conditions, but in practice, they would be. And then next, even more surprisingly, because all of the patients in the Maryland system, in fact, more or less, like 75%, got that top priority score, the age tiebreaker dominated the SOFA score. And what Maryland ended up kind of resulting in is a, a youngest first protocol where nobody over the age of 70 was allocated critical care. Now, again, this is not, was definitely not intended by the designers of the Maryland system. But before you apply it to um, the, this, your protocol to data, you can't actually see if it's intent. It's achieving the intended uh, ethical consequences you you wanted, and then you know, disappointingly, but I guess not an unsurprisingly, in all three state protocol, self-identified black patients were less likely to see, receive critical care, and this falls directly from the fact that black patients had higher SOFA scores at presentation and increased levels of chronic conditions. Um, um, you know, we're more likely to have comorbid conditions. So again, our fears are that these al allocation algorithms could exacerbate healthcare disparities were realized. All right, so I'm over time, but you know, there's, I think we've already mentioned sort of the limitations of this analysis this is a static model. We, you know, we had to, we're, we're not capturing any of the diamondism of what actually happens when patients are allocated to, or uh, going up to the ICU and all of the, the complexities therein. Um, and, but I, but I wanted to finish with this point that, you know, I think simulation model and empirical analysis plays in a really important role in these types of allocation decisions, because, you know, in theory, what you would do is, you know, you design your normative ethical framework out of that pops out an allocation protocol, then you observe the empirical outcomes with that protocol, and then you fine tune your protocol to achieve your normative ethical framework, right? But it may actually cause you to think a little bit more carefully about the way you constructed those ethical principles together um, and how they're constraining each other and how they're weighed relative to whatever. Once you actually see the consequences intended and unintended, maybe it, caught, it makes you to go back and start doing some more ethics. Um, so it's both an implementation science problem as well as an ethical analysis uh, issue. Um, so with, with our next steps is to more to better model this process with a dynamic micro simulation that Burhan Sandiki from Booth has already built. It works great on historical data, and we're just about to get enough COVID data to make this work um, uh, for patients with COVID-19. And I'm over, but I have to make a plug for relative scarcity and like we just the previous panel was discussing large academic centers with many icu beds simply have better outcomes for critically ill patients with COVID 19 and they need to bear the brunt of the burden and take care of these patients so elective surgeries need to stop and these hospitals need to focus on saving lives from critically ill patients with COVID 19 we can do it um, we're very good at it, and that should be, that's our role, our moral obligation in the, in the pandemic. So with that, I'm going to finish 
and introduce our next speaker. I'm sorry, I ran a little bit over. Um, Dr. John LaPuma, he's a clinical director and founder of the, of the Chef Clinic, the healthy eating and fitness program to prevent and treat obesity, uh, maintain weight loss and promote wellness. He's also a professionally trained chef, organic farmer and board certified physician who's pioneered the field of culinary medicine. Dr. LaPuma is author or co-authored seven books, two of which are New York Times bestsellers, Dr. LaPuma also co-founded ChefMD, a Freddie Award-winning health media brand that promotes culinary medicine. Additionally, he co-hosts Lifetime TV's Health Corner and hosts PBS's ChefMD Shorts, as well as PBS specials on diet and fitness. Dr. LaPuma also recently released a documentary series on nature therapy called Green RX. Today, Dr. LaPuma will give a talk titled Silver Linings to the Pandemic. Some good news. Uh, we're all Looking for that, forward to that talk um, for sure. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. John Lapoom. Well, thank you so much. Really enjoyed your talk. It was great. Um, I'm going to speak today a little bit about silver linings of the pandemic, uh, seven in particular. Um, so, if we could have the first slide, please. Thank you. Um, well, let me let me talk about my disclosures first. Uh, I'm not, I'm founder, as Will mentioned, of uh, Chef Clinic and um, Chef MD and uh, Plant with a Doc, uh, which is a new iteration of Green RX. I'm not going to be discussing off label or investigational uses of drugs unless you count plants and food, which I do. Uh, so there's that. Um, today, where does silver lining come from? Milton actually coined the term in 1634 in his work Comus I, and he described it as appearing underneath a sable cloud, a dark cloud. Uh, he also coined the term pandemonium in 1667, 30 years later in Paradise Lost uh, in that mask, and um, a few years later wrote Paradise Regained. So Milton was way ahead. He saw that there were bright spots even when there was darkness. He described hell, which a lot of us have been through. And then he saw a way out. And I want to say that here are seven ways that we can think of that way out right now. Um, first, there has been during the pandemic, a moral elevation of scientists and clinicians. We're finally kind of cool again. Um, and the idea that healthcare has a lane has been made front and center. Uh, Donald Burwick wrote in uh, JAMA in July about um, the moral determinants of health uh, in a wonderful essay that I'm sure you've all read and that I recommend to anyone who has it. The question, of course, is whether we ought to diagnose and treat like doctors do and only do that, or if we should, as Will just alluded to, improve social conditions and do it in a way that is about policy, not just about treating patients. Um, you'll see from this Pew Research data that the confidence of the medical, of me, in medical scientists and in scientists in general actually has risen over time. And the ethical standards of medical doctors you'll be happy to see has gone up in 2020. Um, the same thing is true for um, the percentage of U.S. adults who say scientists should take an active role in a 60-40 split and make usually better choices around policy decisions than other people, uh, or at least not as neither better nor worse. Um, our second, oh, that's a preview. Our second silver lining is that gardening and home cooking are now essential. They're not just nice to have or something you do on a weekend, but they're really important. And that's a wonderful thing because they have all kinds of beneficial effects. They get you outside if you're gardening, they help you move, they um, give you a feeling of accomplishment both for cooking and gardening. They're meditative, both of them. And of course they help you escape boredom, which uh, if you overeat really isn't so good. 40 square foot garden can help you sequester either a quarter to a half a ton of carbon. That's something that actually makes a difference in climate change. More of us than ever are eating at home and stress baking. I gave you a quick preview of the slide that shows chocolate chip cookie dough, which some people believe is a separate cookie than cooked chocolate chip cookies, baked chocolate chip cookies. But nevertheless, this is how people have been stress baking. Um, this 
this is really how one ought to be baking or rather cooking and doing so. And we're seeing more of this as well with fresh greens, with uh, whole eggs and with oranges. Oranges during the pandemic, actually in the second quarter of this year, uh, were the most popular fruit uh, uh, ever that is uh, by cash sales. Um, about 75% of Florida's oranges have been lost, as you probably know, to a greening disease, but California produces about 80% of the country's oranges. Nevertheless, people have bought them because they associate them with better immunity because of their vitamin C content. Never mind that a red bell pepper has four times the vitamin C of a beautiful Washington navel. Um, gardening and cooking are important, not just because they give you more produce, because they reduce your uh, bills, because they alleviate boredom and can be meditative, as I said, but also because they actually have a therapeutic value. They begin to relieve stress. That, that idea that being in touch with nature and being in touch with the soil is a powerful uh, personal tool to feeling better, and we all need to. Uh, here Josie is with four large Armenian cucumbers that we grew from one vine, and here are pickles that you can make from those cucumbers, uh, and someone did in a photo of pickled um, cucumbers and tomatoes. This all to show that putting up what you grow, using extras from what you grow, is part of what we've been learning. The third silver lining, climate change is actually reversible, who knew? And that the outdoors is safer than the indoors. In a particular matter of 2.5 microns in carbon dioxide and nitrogen dioxide pollution all dropped in the first quarter. They all have started to go up in the second and now third quarter. But for a while, there were dolphins in the Venice canals. You could see the Himalayas. You could hear the dawn chorus and the songs from the songbirds making up the dawn chorus were both more complex and softer because there was less ambient noise and noise pollution. Um, here you see the uh, drop in carbon dioxide emissions in the first quarter of 2020, more than any other year in the last 120, according to this nature sh study, showing that we can actually begin to reverse this if we are resolved to. The fourth silver lining is that mindfulness became essential. Not just a tool of titans like Tim Ferriss writes about in his great book for about CEOs and productivity and creativity, and not just for nutty Californians, but for everybody who wants to be able to focus and not have the pressure of the world upon them with everything from echo anxiety to, um, to homelessness and other serious problems. For example, see this side of the top iPhone app downloads, and you can find the top four iPhone app downloads in the last year of Calm. Uh, the next one is number four, Motivation. The next one, Headspace. And then the final one, Reflectly. Of these four of the top nine iPhone downloads and health and fitness can turn meditation. If you don't have a meditation practice, you should investigate one because it helps you focus, it helps you concentrate, it helps you put things in perspective. The next slide will show those kinds of trends in either in the next, in the final quarter, where we see calm, reflectively, headspace, fabulous, and then to a lesser extent, Metatopia, all in the top 100 downloads of iPhone health and fitness apps in the last corner. Again, emphasizing the importance of meditation in keeping, uh, keeping same. Fifth silver lining, it created perspective, as I just alluded to with this meditation practice. What is really most important to us? What is it that you get up in the morning for? Do you get up in the morning and concern yourself with self-care? Well, perhaps you should. Do you get your, up in the morning and concern yourself with community care? Oh, is that, how are those related? COVID has showed us that those are intimate related. You really can't have one without the other if you want to participate in American life. What is one small tangible thing that you can do today or tomorrow, because today's almost over, tomorrow to make somebody else's life in the community better? That might be a family member, it might be someone next door, it might be someone cross country. If you think about that, one small tangible thing you can do today to, to make someone else's life better, then everything begins to have a 
perspective. You have developed perspective. And that perspective is truly valuable and, of course, at the core of ethics. The sixth silver lining. More pets have been adopted and fostered in the last six months than in the previous 30 months. There is 43% less in euthanasia. Adoption rate of, of pets is up 73% over the same time period last year. This data from uh, uh, Corollary Society to the Humane Society. Um, it is remarkable that we are saving so many lives of dogs and cats, and I'm not being facetious. They are wonderful, they offer unconditional love, and in this uh, study showed by nextdoor.com, a not terribly scientific study, members in California versus the uh, US were, were asked about whether they uh, intend to adopt pets. This shows that it's a national phenomenon, that that pet adoption, and we're going to have an adopted pet in the White House for the first time ever in January. All the other pets have been from breeders, by the way. And that's remarkable because saving lives of animals is a powerful tool for doing good, which is, of course, what we all want to do. And as well-being is the goal of medicine, that creates more well-being. As you care for animals, they, in, in a way, care for you as well. And then finally, who wouldn't want to adopt this or this? Unconditional love. Save a dog, save a life, adopt, don't shop. Next, and finally, um, we got to binge watch four seasons of The Good Place during the pandemic this year in 2020. Uh, that is an improvement. Over last year, we only got to binge watch three seasons of The Good Place. They are available on Netflix. I recommend you do so if you haven't, and I'll show you a couple of clips to show why. Um, as you know, The Good Place is a sitcom originally aired on NBC, now on Netflix, that uh, puts front and center ethical principles. It is a way to make ethics fun, funny, and at the same time, ask the important questions that ethics does. Uh, it's more successful than any other television show I know, or actually any other feature film I know in communicating a lot of the things that we care about, the hard questions of what's right and what's wrong, and of helping people see those questions as, in fact, ethics questions, not financial ones or social ones, but in fact, ones of right and wrong. Now here, um, we get to see ethical principles on television, and with it, we get to see their, the humanity of the people who, who voice them. Um, here's a blooper to start. Let's see if we can do this. Utilitarian, not utilitarian. Utilit, I know, more than I read all the same books Mike read for <laughs> research for the part. I have read none. Uh, yes, she did. And uh, Kristen Bell can make anything wonderful. And Mike, of course, is the creator of The, Great, uh, the Good Place. He also... Uh, created Parks and Rec. Um, he's a really talented guy, Mike Schur. Um, here is another way that Good Place instructs us about our humanity and the questions that we deal with with patients all the time, but in a different way. Where do we go next? I won't exactly know what's going to happen after I die. Nothing more human than that. Besides texting people that you're five minutes away when you haven't even left the house. Nothing more human than that. Nothing better as an actor than Ted Danson in a sitcom. Nothing more important than putting front and center what it means to be human, especially during this time of COVID. And then finally, uh, here is a, a little clip that shows what a good teacher can do. Lessons of ethics. It's only when the act of studying is combined with the process of relating to others that we become better. You've been our teacher this whole time, and we are much better because of you. And that is really true. Um, Mark Siegler, we are much better because of you. And thank you so much for your attention. Well, thank you, John. That was, uh, that was just what I think a lot of us needed, especially me staring at the barrel at several weeks in the what will increasingly become a COVID ICU, some silver linings. Nice to find.
Uh, and I, I have the privilege of, oh, I'm supposed to, from a housekeeping point of view, um, remind you to put your questions in the Q&A uh, session and then upvote the ones you want us to ask us because there's already a lot. So we'll have to focus our efforts. Um, but now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alexi uh, Torkey. It's the Associate Professor of Medicine and Associate Division Chief of General Internal Medicine and Geriatrics at Indiana University. Additionally, Dr. Torkey is the director of the Daniel F. Evans uh, Center for Spiritual and Religious Values in Healthcare, and also the fellowship director of the Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics. She's also a research scientist with the Indiana, Indiana University Center for Aging Research at the, oh, I'm going to maybe miss this one, Reagan Strife Institute, and practices outpatient palliative care at IU Health uh, Methodist Hospital. Her research focuses on end-of-life care, patient communication, spiritual aspects of care, and surrogate decision-making. She was the first person to describe and analyze the relationship between doctors and healthcare surrogates. Today, Dr. Corky will give it a talk titled, Surrogate Decision-Making in COVID-19 Patients. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Lexi Torkey. Hi, thank you all. It's great to be here. Um, and I agree that that talk by Dr. LaPuma was just what I needed. I feel calmer already. So we can begin with um, my first slide. Um, I don't have any um, disclosures, but have some NIH funding. Um, back when Mark asked me to give this talk, um, my head was just spinning. We were in the early stages of the pandemic. It was really all I could think about. Um, I usually don't do any inpatient care, but probably like some of you, I was called in to do inpatient palliative care consults um, to help support our incredibly busy service. Um, and I was living um, through new challenges in um, a topic that I've researched for many years, um, surrogate decision making. Um, for this talk, I'm going to take us back to the earlier stages of the pandemic and talk about a case um, I'll also talk a little bit about some research we've been doing about provider experiences and also um, some innovations that um, we've been using to help support our patients and families. Um, you know, and then we'll think about how we might address similar cases going forward. So take yourself back to early April. There was tremendous uncertainty um, about transmission to clinicians, as other speakers have mentioned, especially during resuscitation, intubation, and procedures. There was restriction on providing resuscitation, at least in our institution, where we were really encouraged not to go running into rooms, but to make sure we were wearing proper PPE before we um, initiated resuscitation. There was restriction or complete shutdown of family visitors, um, which put family in, in a place of increased distress and grief as they made decisions and coped with serious illness um, from far away. There were actual shortages and also feared shortages of PPE, particularly things like N95 masks and PAPR. Um, there were staffing and unit reorganizations in many hospitals, including ours. There was fear of ventilator shortages, although we did not actually experience that, and I think um, really very few places have yet. There was poor knowledge of COVID disease management, which was incredibly distressing. We didn't know what medications to use, what ICU and ventilator settings to use, um, things like prone positioning um, and other strategies were just being uncovered. And finally, tremendous clinician distress about so many aspects, um, many of which have been covered by other speakers. Um, I'm gonna briefly tell you about a study that um, I conducted with one of our fellows at the time, Ariba Javed, who's now um, gone off um, to Wayne State University, but she conducted a cross-sectional survey of clinicians in May through June of 2020 in two large health systems in Indianapolis that was administered electronically and got a response rate of about 25% um, with over a thousand respondents. Um, I just wanna I want to describe some of her findings because I think it gives some examples um, of the kind of distress people were feeling. Um, many of our, probably the majority of our respondents um, were physicians and nurse practitioners. Um, we also had small numbers of um, nurses, social workers and others um, and the specialty were primarily in internal medicine, although um, there was a wide variety, and 89% had participated in direct patient care during the COVID times. Um, we first asked them questions about moral distress, um, kind of items that we identified um, a priori that might cause moral distress. I wish I'd asked something specifically about surrogate decision-making, but I really didn't think of it at the time. Um, and as you can see, um, the one that was most common was wishing witnessing the rationing of health care resources. 
um, followed by um, witnessing deviation of clinical practices from the standard of care. We asked um, for those who endorsed um, having experienced the item, we asked them to rate it on a moral distress thermometer from zero to 10, which has been a, a measure that's been validated. And you can see that things cluster pretty closely, um, moderate to high distress um, for all these items for the variety of, um, of experiences. Um, looking at general distress, there was tremendous suffering, witnessing um, suffering in patients and families. Um, fear of litigation was quite high, surprisingly, um, given that in other surveys we found that to be quite low. Watching colleagues suffer um, and not having access to the PPE um, that people needed um, were all things that were either, um, you know, that were that caused suffering. Fear of transferring disease to a family member was also quite high. Um, but finally, positive emotions, which, I, you know, I think to John's point about silver linings, um, I, I truly feel that um, clinicians felt a, a calling, and I think we see that validation of that, um, that while the pandemic has been terrible and continues to be terrible, um, many people did experience um, things like witnessing their colleagues providing excellent care, supporting each other during this crisis, and witnessing healthcare systems um, developing ethical policies. Um, we also used the impact of event scale and found that 13% had high scores suggestive of risk of post-traumatic stress, um, something that we're going to have to watch for carefully. So I really do that to set the stage to the case. Um, so here it is, um, the end of March, beginning of April. Um, many of us have been called in from other services. We are extremely scared and stressed out. We worry about endangering our, patient, our families um, and ourselves. Um, and into that context, um, I came upon this case. Mr. Smith, a 78-year-old man with advanced COPD and a history of stroke, who was cared for at home by his daughter. She comes to his home daily to visit him and help with meals. He becomes short of breath in April on 2nd and was brought to the emergency room. Two sons fly into town from across the country and want to visit their father. None of the family are allowed to see him. They ask for an exception to the visitor policy so all three can visit daily. They're told no. He develops respiratory distress and the attending physician goes to the bedside to discuss goals of care and preferences for intubation. He says he wants full treatment. He's intubated and transferred to the ICU. Three days later, he's completely unresponsible. Unresponsive, sorry. Blood pressure is 80 over 44 on two pressors. That means that it is tanking, you know, his blood pressure is dropping despite maximal interventions. He's on 100% oxygen. His arterial pH is 7.29, which is abnormal, very abnormal. His physicians do not think he'll survive the day. So um, I'll talk a little bit um, briefly about our ethical model. This will be very familiar to most of you. Um, it's a widespread framework um, put forward by Buchanan and Brock. That we, and we asked two questions, who decides? Surrogates have high authority, um, both those appointed by the patient and the defaults in state law. And then we have well agreed upon principles that prioritize respect for autonomy, advanced directive substituted judgment. Um, and as we know, Daniel um, Brudney has put forward the idea that a narrative view can be helpful. Um, and then also best interests. And this contrasts with pandemic decision making in which central decision making is much more centralized. And our primary principle is to promote the common good um, through concepts such as greatest good for the greatest number, a utilitarian framework or justice and fairness. Respect for autonomy and best interest might matter, but they are not the primary guides. Um, so back to these case, back to these principles, um, this is the setting in which we find ourselves um, that I think really increases our anxiety um, about how we proceed. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a, a volunteer initiative um, that our palliative care service undertook. Um, we were as of the first weekend of April, completely overwhelmed in our Indiana hospitals. Um, and there were two things that we did. Um, one is we recruited clinicians from closed departments, such as outpatient care and surgery. Um, we interviewed people to determine their prior experience and serious illness communication, and then provided them with a one hour training through our ethics center on advanced care planning and serious illness. Um, we recruited three nurses, two physical therapists at our downtown hospital and actually several others um, around, around our um, health system. We also had several oncology physicians volunteer to do palliative care consults. And if you know any history about many relationships between palliative care and oncology, you'll realize that that is quite wonderful. 
They provided additional palliative care consultations on weekends and in the evenings and were assigned to units to round with ICU teams and identify unmet palliative care issues. Um, we really thought that they would primarily do advanced care planning. And in fact, they did do 22 advanced care planning conversations with patients who were decisional and completed 12 healthcare representative documents. But we realized that actually an incredibly amazing thing they could do was video visits. Our um, patients and families had such anxiety about being separated from each other. And it was so hard to facilitate family meetings. Um, and so these video visits connecting patients and families um, even connecting families with patients who were intubated and completely unresponsive, but who could hear the voice um, of their family member and the family member could at least express their love um, and concern for the patient. Here's a quote from one of our nurses. I had the most meaningful interaction with M while he was still on the vent and video conferencing with C. M was awake and kept looking up at me and then back to C. He did this five or six times, then mouthed the word thank you to me. I was overwhelmed with emotion to think that this man who'd been critically ill for over two weeks and unable to see his family is thanking me, a stranger in protective gear from head to toe. I tried to keep it together, but the tears came, collecting in my goggles and running into my mask. Back to the case. The palliative care service was consulted. We did some interventions that include using Zoom and FaceTime between the palliative care team and family. Um, we conducted video visits so the family could speak to the patient, even though the patient was completely unresponsive, and the chaplain conducted meetings with the family by phone. The physician called the daughter and stated that he, the patient is dying and that the physician plans to withdraw life-sustaining treatment and shift in goals to comfort. The daughter was tearful but did not protest. She requested another video visit with multiple family members to say goodbye. Over an hour is spent with an iPad facing the patient so family members could take turns saying goodbye. The ventilator and pressors were stopped and the patient died within 15 minutes. Um, I wanna pause for a minute here just to reflect on my own reactions um, to this case as the palliative care provider. Um, I have um, struggled over time with the degree of autonomy that we often allow families under the best of circumstances. We um, often provide care that clinicians think is unwise or not medically indicated because families want it, sometimes because they articulate that that's something that the patient would have wanted. Sometimes it's because they perhaps are not ready to shift the goals of comfort themselves. Um, but in general, we allow families a wide degree of leeway. I think it's important to note that we, at least in our health system, made some changes to our approach to surrogate decision making, even without having actually run out of ventilators. Um, the stress about the unknown, the lack of knowledge about appropriate treatment, the lack of PPE, and the fear of running into a situation in which we had limited ventilators actually changed our um, approach to practice in ways that I don't even think we fully realized at the time. So I think it's important to acknowledge um, that while we thought that ventilator triage was not upon us, there were in fact ways in which we were adjusting our standards of care um, for a pandemic setting. In some ways, I think this is probably appropriate. Um, I think that there were many patients in the ICU, such as this patient, who were almost certainly not going to survive their hospitalization, and that taking a clearer stand um, about the use of life-sustaining treatment in that setting may be appropriate, um, but it raises challenging issues. I feel challenged, and I hope you feel challenged with me, um, and as we get to um, questions, I, I hope you'll ask some probing questions about um, how we address this case um, and how we address cases going forward. I'll say in closing that we are in a state where cases are rising again. Um, as you see, um, basically, you know, our, you know, with every passing day, cases are skyrocketing. Um, and in fact, um, it, we are now at risk of running into another ventilator triage situation. Um, and so um, I think we're entering into a new wave where we're going to be facing these challenges again. Um, and that we're in fact ventilator triage may become a reality. So thank you for walking with me through um, our experiences and uh, my experience with this case. 
Um, and again, I just, I do really do want to thank all of you. Um, it's so good to be here with you and to have this time to kind of pause for a moment um, and consider um, our experience with COVID um, as we move into the next phase of the pandemic. So thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Torkey. That was uh, an excellent talk. You know, I think mine was more about this crisis scenario of absolute scarcity that we haven't hit yet, but there's plenty of ethical controversies to ponder in the contingency care strain situation that most of us experience. Um, now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anup Manali. He's the uh, Lee and Brina Freeman Professor at the University of Chicago Law School and a professor of medicine at Pritzker. Uh, Professor Manali has clerked for Judge Stephen Williams of the U.S. Court of Appeals for D.C. and, and, and J for Justice Andrea O'Connor in the U.S. Supreme Court. Professor Manali's interests in include uh, health economics and development economics. He has contributed significant research on healthcare financing and quality of life in the urban slums of India, notably through the Indian Health Insurance Experiment and his impact evaluation of Mission uh, Kakataya. Uh, today, Dr. Professor Malnali will give a talk titled Ethical Issues in India's Response to COVID-19. Please recommend, please join me in welcoming Dr. Noom uh, Malani. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Um, uh, I don't know if everybody can see the presentations, uh, so if we can go ahead and start that. Great. Um, so let me go ahead and begin with my disclosure. So I don't have any particularly particular conflicts of interest. I have some funding from Asian Development Bank to support some of the work that we've been doing for the Indonesian government on COVID response, and then funding uh, uh, that we're receiving from the University of Chicago and elsewhere uh, to support uh, our efforts to help the Indian government in its response um, and to do some research there and then some prizes uh, uh, that were associated with the work that we did. Okay, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on India and then uh, and COVID in India and then I'm gonna talk about some of the ethical challenges uh, that we've faced. Uh, I wanna preface all this by saying I'm not an ethicist. I don't have really great training in ethics. Uh, uh, you know, I would call it an undergraduate level of understanding. Uh, but I do uh, think that there are difficult ethical issues uh, that are involved based upon that understanding. And so uh, I'm going to apologize ahead of time for using uh, what I would call non-technical language and see being uh, kind of simplistic about these ethical issues. But uh, I uh, appreciate uh, you give me some leeway there. So let me go ahead and give you a little bit of background of what happens in India. It's uh, just a more severe case of what you see in the United States. Uh, so this is a figure that describes what happens uh, over time. So just before the epidemic hits through the beginning of the epidemic, uh, you see these uh, dashed lines and dotted lines that gives you a, those are measures of the severity of the lockdown that you saw in India. Uh, and then you see these uh, colorful lines, solid ones that are just basic, basic uh, Google mobility lines for different sectors. And you can see that there's a massive decline around March, uh, massive increase in, in lockdowns and a massive decline in uh, corresponding decline in mobility, uh, especially in, in work areas. The only place where mobility rises as, as we see everywhere is in, is in, uh, in residential. Interesting about this is that some of the decline occurs a little bit before the lockdown actually happens, uh, but this is a quite a severe lockdown. If you look at the dashed line, that's the, the that's India's lockdown measured by our world and data uh, and on their severity metric. The dotted line is uh, the United States, so it was a much more severe uh, lockdown. Uh, and this continues, so this is now extending it past June to something closer to the present, uh, and you can see that um, uh, mobility actually has returned about 50%, uh, and the lockdown severity has fallen, uh, so there's kind of a, a lockdown fatigue that's settling in uh, and a relaxation. Now, <laughs> Unsurprisingly, you're also seeing a, a, a skyrocketing of cases. Confir these are confirmed cases. Uh, so just as as the uh, as severity of uh, uh, the mobility reduction is is coming back, that is to say, mobility is coming back. You're also seeing in the black line uh, an increase in the number of daily cases. Um, of course, when you're interpreting that, you have to be a little bit careful because testing is also rising. Testing per million, the green line, uh, is also rising. 
uh, during this period. But I, I don't think there's any question that there's an increase in the number of cases that we've seen, uh, at least as measured by confirmed uh, cases. I'm going to give you a little bit different story uh, in a sec. So I want to talk about a little bit about the ethical issues that have come up as we provided public health consultation to the Indian government, and that's both the center uh, and and states. So the first one is, um, as I said, India had a massive lockdown. Uh, um, it was quite severe, uh, but it, interestingly, in India, uh, there's a lot of opposition to. I mean, there's a lot of opposition to the lockdown in the United States, but it was just. Uh, um, uh, uh, kind of at a higher level, I would say, uh, in India. And one of the issues that comes up, uh, although the next slide is going to give you even a more salient issue, one of the issues that comes up is that there's a implicitly a massive redistribution that's involved in lockdown. Uh, so uh, on the right-hand side, you're going to see two figures that are based upon two studies we did. One is based upon a serological study we did in Mumbai and in, in slums and non-slums of Mumbai. Uh, we we're also able to look at what the age distribution of IFR is using those that that representative serological study, uh, and you see a, a you know a, a older individuals uh, have a higher death rate. Um, on the bottom, we were providing uh, some services to, to kind of uh, to Bihar, helping them uh, analyze tests that were coming in, their RT-PCR tests. And again, you can see this massive uh, skew in the probability of death given COVID in Bihar. The levels were lower in Mumbai uh, than they are in Bihar, but there's still this skew and you're getting numbers something like, uh, you know, if you're over 70, you have, a, let's say, a 30 times greater likelihood of dying than if you're under 20. Now, what that implies is that when you think about a lockdown, if it's reducing the probability of infection evenly across the population, and as far as we can tell from the data, the probability of getting infected is uh, uh, roughly even across the ages, uh, but the health benefits are dramatically higher uh, in uh, the older individuals. So older individuals are getting a lot more of health benefit. Um, but then when you think about the economic costs, the economic costs are kind of evenly split. If anything, older individuals, because they're more likely to be retired, have a lower cost. And what that suggests is that there's this massive redistribution that's going on, which has ethical implications. Uh, so in lockdown, we're basically asking younger individuals, uh, in some sense, to, to cross-subsidize older individuals. I'm not saying that it's not net beneficial to have a lockdown. I'm just saying that there's uh, disparate impacts uh, or benefits of a lockdown. Um, so let me uh, go ahead and advance the slide and, and show you another dimension along which this is true. Um, so here uh, on the right is a study that I'm working on with Arpit Gupta where we look at, we have a panel data of what happens, very detailed data on the finances of uh, uh, about 175,000 households in India over the last few years, including into, into COVID. And what we see is a that when COVID hits, so you see on that uh, x-axis dates, the first dashed line is the first case that you see in India. The second dashed line is when India does a lockdown. Uh, we're plotting your income uh, for different income uh, occupational categories relative to what it was or as a percentage of what it was uh, in March 2019. And you can see that there is a massive do drop off in income, much more severe than you see in the United States by far uh, for all, nearly all, all all occupational groups. But you see that, you know, white like uh, 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 people that are salaried employees, white collar, blue collar, they're seeing a maybe 25, 35 percent percent drop. But if you look at the poorest people, so people that are daily wage earners, um, uh, daily laborers, they're seeing a 90% drop in income. Massive, massive reduction, and this persists. Uh, so I'm not showing you the, the data that we have going out, but this, is, this kind of captures the falling off a cliff. It's shocking. And unlike the United States, there's no CARES Act, uh, so there's not a lot of fiscal support to buffer that. Um, but what this really implies, though, uh, is that there's another massive redistribution that's going on in the lockdown. Uh, lockdown's economic costs are being borne by the poor, uh, but the health benefits are roughly evenly distributed in the population as far as we can tell. Uh, so that's uh, kind of the, the kind of the big benefit, a big impact. Um, in fact, you could also make the argument that the health benefits are a little bit bigger for the rich because they happen to live a little bit longer too. So in terms of life years that you would sacrifice, it would be bigger for uh, uh, rich individuals than poor individuals. So again, there's a, a health skew as well. So let me uh, now turn, that was uh, uh, um, uh, talking about um, uh, lockdown, but now I want to think about ethical issues associated with testing. So we've been doing a lot of testing, either supporting through data analysis, RT-PCR testing that states are doing, or by doing all our own serological work. Um, but that raises a really interesting question around informed consent. So, so let me set the frame here. India tells people they got to they got to give up work, uh, and that doesn't give them a choice. Say you know voluntarily give up work. 
Um, it tells people that they can't get access to certain types of health care because we're, we're, we're kind of shutting down access to a lot of facilities, elective services. Again, you don't have a choice in this matter. Um, and in fact, it could have done the exact same thing with respect to testing. They actually invoked what's called the Pandemic Act from 19, 1897 and said, we can make people test. But in practice, they didn't. They actually required consent to get tested for a lot of their work, especially for their serological surveys, including the serological surveys that we supported in Mumbai and Karnataka. Um, and I'm going to show you in the next slide is the, the result of one of these. Uh, I'll show you the other one in the next one. But this is one that just came out uh, this week. Uh, it is a serological study in the state of Karnataka, population 67 million. It's in south and central India. Uh, we went around the, through various regions of Karnataka, both in urban and rural areas, and we found shocking results in terms of, of seroprevalence. So we're finding overall seroprevalence uh, um, of, six, of 46%. Uh, and then you see something like 44% in rural areas and 53% in urban areas. It's a very, uh, India is much less urbanized than say the United States is. Um, so that's suggesting that, that, that you know, there's, there's high urbanization, but, it, but it's really important to remember, oops, I think it's, uh, I wanna go this way. Um, it's important to remember that we, in, we required consent. And now consent raises the possibility that you're getting a biased estimate. That is to say people uh, that are more likely to, uh, have had COVID in the past are more likely to consent, you're going to overestimate. Uh, if it's the opposite, you'll underestimate seroprevalence. And so one of the things that we did to, to check to see if this is true, and we had a unique data set that allowed us to look at people that didn't consent because we had the historical data, as well as the people that did consent. Um, and what we found is that there's dramatically different results. That is to say, the sorts of people that consent are different along tons of dimensions, education, income, etc. And so you are going to have to seriously think about whether consent is biasing your results, even in a representative sample. Um, and, and that seems like a, a very important issue when uh, it's the studies like this that are guiding suppression policies. And so you might want to ask yourself, you know, if we're doing requiring people to give up work or certain elective surgeries without consent, should we also require them to test without consent? Would that give us, would that inform public policy a little bit better? Uh, would that be better uh, overall? Okay, so let me, uh, oops, let me go ahead and tell you about another uh, test. Uh, but here I'm not going to talk about testing, we talk about the ethics of lockdown. Um, uh, so this is kind of like that first issue about what the redistributive effect is. Here I want to focus specifically uh, narrowly on lockdown in slums. So one of the studies we did back in July, and we did it again in, in August, is we did a zero prevalence study, uh, again representative populations in slums and non-slums of the city of Mumbai. Uh, and uh, one of the notable findings that we had from this was that the that as of early July, uh, uh, zero positivity and zero prevalence in slums was dramatically higher, about three to four times higher in slums than non-slums. The level in slums was around 58% zero prevalence, and the level in non-slums was around 16-17%. Uh, so that's one six one seven as opposed to uh, six seven. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, five eight uh, percent. So that's a massive difference. And so um, you want to ask, like, how is it in July that we already got this? And, and one possibility that, that you kind of have to entertain or, or seems natural to entertain is, did lockdown actually cause these problems? Uh, so, for example, maybe what happened was we made people go home. Those people that went to their slums, they didn't actually, uh, while they weren't interacting with the world generally, they were in closed quarters with tons of other people. Uh, like the example I like to give is the average distance between any two people in the slum of Dharavi. Uh, which is the slum, for example, you might remember from Slumdog Millionaire, um, the average distance is uh, six, six feet. Uh, so if that's what, what's going on in slums uh, and you're using things like communal toilets, maybe what you did is you basically increased the average level of density that they lived in uh, because they had to stay home rather than getting out, um, and that might have accelerated the epidemic. So that, that's kind of a really interesting thing. Then compounding that is that now, even though uh, 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 maybe a majority of these individuals are actually now recovered, now we're saying let them out in the population. Now, in fact, they might be safer if they stayed in slums at this point because they've already gone over the hump. Uh, um, but uh, if you let them out in the population, implicitly you're providing protection to the non-slum dwellers who were protected by lockdown in the first place. So that kind of raises some interesting questions of who should be bearing the costs and benefits and how that varies over the timeline uh, of an epidemic. So let me, uh, uh, with my final uh, few minutes, talk a little bit about vaccination. So one of the things that we're working on now is we're taking the serological studies that we've done uh, in India, some of the uh, data analysis we've done in Indonesia, and generate vaccine allocation plans uh, for those countries. So these are 
plans that say if you've got a limited number of doses, who should you vaccinate first, second, and third? Uh, we calculate the direct and indirect benefits of vaccination for different demographic groups in different locations. The direct benefits is the benefit to mark uh, of vaccinating mark uh, uh, and the uh, indirect benefits are something like what is the indirect benefit to Alexia of vaccinating mark uh, something like that so we calculate these things and then we we come up with uh, social demand curves uh, for different groups so on the right you see an example of one we did for Indonesia uh, across the different provinces and different age groups Okay, when we did these demand curves and we, we monetize the value of life because the Ministry of Finance asked us to do that to help them figure out how much to spend on vaccination, um, we have to decide whether we can do VSL or VSLY. In the right, we did VSL, but we can see that there's massive differences when you do VSL versus VSLY. Not only does our prioritization change shifting towards younger populations to some extent, but it's also the case that the absolute value of the vaccination falls dramatically uh, when you value life years. Uh, and the reason is, I think, pretty probably pretty clear to people uh, that are in this group. And so they're implicitly in that strong uh, redistributive effects, thus ethical decisions that are embedded uh, in your uh, vaccination decision. So let me try one last thing uh, in my last uh, 20 seconds or so. Um, one really interesting thing in all of this is uh, that doesn't get a lot of attention is the speed with which we finish vaccination. Uh, so uh, an interesting question is, you know, uh, we know, especially in developing countries, lower income and middle income countries, vaccines are going to come later than they're going to come in developed countries, at least as a percentage of the population. Um, so speed really matters for those guys. Uh, so delays in development of vaccinations actually pushes that out a little bit further. Um, so what we'd like to do is have it done faster. So a natural way to do this is to do, for example, human challenge trials that get you a lot more cases quickly. Uh, and the standard objection to this is, well, this is bad uh, because, you know, the people that would take the human challenge trials, uh, you know, it might be unethical for them. Even if you paid them, it would be the poor that would take it up. Uh, the same arguments made against, uh, you know, for example, uh, the army and, and uh, uh, the all volunteer force. Um, but we're comfortable making those decisions in other contexts like construction and the army and, and all sorts of risky jobs. The question is, should we be comfortable in this context, especially when from a consequentialist perspective in the long run, poor countries and poor individuals might actually benefit uh, if we are able to get the vaccine earlier. In fact, they benefit more because they're maybe less able to suppress uh, and stay home. Let me stop there uh, and because uh, I think my time's done. All right. Well, thank you for that fantastic talk, Professor Mwane. It's always interesting to see the economic lens apply to this these problems. Um, so we'll transition to our last talk of the session from Dr. Uh, Lydia Dugdale, um, who is the Dorothy and L. Daniel H. Silberg Associate Professor of Medicine at Columbia University Vegaleos College of Physicians and Surgeons and Director of the Center of Clinical Medical Ethics. She also serves as Associate Director of Clinical Ethics at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Practicing internist, Dr. Uh, Doug Dale's scholarship focuses on end-of-life issues, medical ethics, and the doctor-patient relationship. She edited the book, Dying in the 21st Century, um, and is now the author of The Lost Art of Dying Well, a popular press book on the preparation for death. Uh, Dr. Dugdale attended medical school at the University of Chicago and completed her residency at Yale New Haven Hospital. Uh, hospital. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lydia Dugdale. Great. Thanks so much uh, to everyone on the panel and thanks to Mark for the invitation. Uh, it's, uh, as so many have said, my career is completely different uh, for the better because of Mark Siegler and I'm grateful to you and to Anna. So thanks so much. Uh, if I could have the slides up, please. So I thought I would start uh, by just painting a picture of what it was like in New York in March. I have lived in New York City for just over one year. After medical school at U of C, I went to Yale for residency, as Will said, and then I stayed on faculty there for a decade. And it was only a couple of years ago that Columbia recruited me uh, to build a center for clinical medical ethics there. So I have to say it's been a very strange season to be a New Yorker. Uh, we moved to the city, COVID hit, and 40% of my neighborhood left the city based on forwarding addresses and cell phone data, and two thirds of the Upper East Side uh, also left the city. So the streets were empty. 
and what was particularly eerie is that you would almost never see children outside. I don't know what kids did who stayed in the city, but you would never see them. The streets were very empty and very quiet, except for the sound of sirens. And the sirens were constant. Uh, it was not uncommon to hear four, five, six ambulances in the space of an hour. And I didn't quite put it all together because there generally is so much noise in New York City. I didn't put the sirens together with the virus until the streets were completely empty. And uh, my daughter pointed it out. And then we started seeing people carried out of their buildings. Uh, in one case, my neighbor across the street was carried out through a window uh, because the EMS were unable to get in through the door. Uh, so it was an eerie, an eerie time and a time of high anxiety in the hospital. Uh, thinking about this sort of current nationwide surge now and contrasting it to what we knew in March, it's very different. Uh, it's a very different time. Um, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to sort of set that stage. I'm going to be talking, however, today about uh, uh, what we experienced as ethics consultants at New York Presbyterian Hospital during the surge. And uh, this paper we published in the Journal of Clinical Ethics, my, my consultant colleagues and I did. And I'll just say this uh, from the beginning, the COVID pandemic as it swept through New York City, it was devastating. Uh, we couldn't test. Uh, we, we could test somewhat, but we only tested patients who met criteria for admission to the hospital because we had such a short supply of the swabs. Uh, we couldn't quarantine people. So I, I mostly was uh, redeployed to the emergency room. I'm an outpatient internist, but I was redeployed to the emergency room. And I was routinely sending patients back to apartments. And I was supposed to tell them, go home and quarantine, use your own bathroom, stay in your own bedroom. And uh, Columbia's Hospital, where I work, is in a largely Hispanic neighborhood. And they would look at me and say, doctor, there are eight people living in a two bedroom. I don't have my own bathroom. I don't have my own bedroom. And we would sort of, you know, sh shrug, I mean, as compassionately as possible. But that, that was the situation that we were in. So when Alexia talked about PTSD, uh, certainly I know that that has been real for many of my colleagues. Uh, we knew that we were spreading COVID and we had no choice uh, but to do that. So we also saw a significant number of uh, consults specifically for COVID patients. And it was so uh, stark, the difference between our normal way of doing ethics consults and what we experienced during the peak of the pandemic that we ended up writing up our results. And we did a, a, actually a series of papers together with colleagues from Cornell. Uh, so let me just give you an idea of, okay, so just, just to sort of paint the picture of what the hospital did, we have two main hospitals. Milstein is the big one up at 168th Street, for those of you who know New York, and the Allen is way north in Manhattan, and uh, so Milstein's a 745-bed uh, acute care hospital, and the Allen is a 225-bed uh, hospital um, that is kind of more like a community hospital, but that we service. Now you can see that the number of ICU beds almost tripled at the Mothership Hospital and almost tripled also at the community hospital. In terms of renal replacement therapy, we can typically accommodate about 15 patients. And during the surge, we had as many as 60 patients who required uh, dialysis. We couldn't do continuous dialysis. And we ended up, interestingly, we, we did not run out of ventilators, and that, that's something that I'd be happy to talk about in the Q&A, but we did experience shortages of dialysate and, of course, of the machines themselves. So we had to get very creative with how we were able to essentially partially dialyze many patients, uh, at, you know, not standard of care, of course, in order to sort of spread around uh, the, the resources that we had. And then, of course, coming up with creative solutions to obtaining dialysate was another part of that. You can see that our ICU nursing doubled or tripled in terms of what the nurses, uh, uh, even quadrupled in terms of the number of patients that the nurses were expected to care for. And then our operating rooms were almost all entirely converted to what we called the ORICUs, the operating room ICUs, makeshift ICUs to accommodate the growing number of patients. And so during the height of the pandemic, we only had three functional operating rooms and they were used for the purposes of uh, emergency surgeries. And that was it. All of the rest of them were for ICU patients. So 
In a, in, in a similar way to the hospital surge and the surge of patients, we had a surge of ethics consultations. And so that's what we describe in this paper. What we did is we took uh, an eight week period starting with March 16th, which was the first day that we had an ethics consult for a patient who was known to be COVID positive. And then we went forward eight weeks from that period. And we contrasted ethics consultations from the 2020 eight week period to the same dates in 2019. And what we found is that during 2020, we had almost a fourfold increase in the number of consultations. So we had almost 100 consults in that eight week period in contrast to 25 the year prior. Uh, interestingly, the vast majority of them were for patients with COVID and that reflected what the state of the hospital was. So 83% of those uh, nearly 100 patients had COVID and at the time, that we were looking at this data, 77% of our patients hospitalized overall had COVID. Uh, now, you, may, you might think that uh, a fourfold increase in ethics consultations during the height of the pandemic is not much. Um, and, and maybe that's true. And I, and I think that the reason why it's only a fourfold increase and not, for example, a six or eightfold increase is because of the work of my palliative care colleagues at Columbia. So similarly to what Alexia described, our palliative care team retrained and then deployed forces, really, armies of folks who could go into the emergency rooms and counsel patients who were presumed to be COVID positive, appeared to have COVID on goals of care. And so this is a paper that my colleagues at Columbia put together. They describe a two week period during the height of the pandemic where they uh, retrained psychiatry residents, fourth year medical students who, we graduated our fourth year medical students early at Columbia to help out in the hospital, and uh, some geriatricians, uh, th there were several several groups, but those are the main ones. And they, they retrained them uh, to be able to have these goals of care conversation and then sent them out in teams. And that had a huge impact, uh, both on sort of getting advanced care documents in place, but also offloading the burden on the ethics uh, consultants. So I'm just gonna highlight a few uh, remarkable uh, pieces of data from our, our study. And that is that uh, we had a significant increase in the number of patients who were Hispanic or Latinx. Uh, you can see that we went from 4% in 2019 to 40%, so a tenfold increase. Uh, we, there's sort of several ways to perhaps explain that. Of course, our primary hospital is located in a largely uh, Dominican neighborhood. Uh, but it's also interesting to note that in non-COVID times, anyone from all over the country would come to Columbia for various reasons. So we have a very large catchment area in non-pandemic times. But what happens during the pandemic? Well, first of all, tons of people get out of, out of town, uh, but they also don't want to come to New York City. Uh, so we did not have, we, we, we largely drew during the pandemic from our neighborhood and only from our neighborhood. And I think that that was reflected both in the number of uh, patients uh, who were in the hospital of Hispanic and Latinx origin, but also of those for whom we were uh, consulted. Um, it's also worth pointing out that uh, our patients during the pandemic were much, much sicker than in non-pandemic times. So if in non-pandemic times, about two thirds of our uh, consultations are in non-ICU patients, it flipped during the height of the pandemic. And about two thirds of our patients for whom we were consulted were located in the ICU. Also notably, the vast majority did not have advanced directives. So only 11% of the patients for whom we were consulted had advanced directives. Now, I told you that the vast majority were uh, of Dominican origin. And when we look at Kaiser Health uh, data for who has advanced directives, we know that nationwide about 37% of people have advanced directives. But of Hispanic communities, uh, the, the typical number is about 11%. So what we found in terms of the patients for whom we were consulted, again, from our neighborhood, it was the fact that about 11% had advanced directives. That's in keeping with uh, data that we have from Kaiser. 
Um, now this, this was interesting. So we uh, broke down all of our consultations into the reasons for the cons consults. And then we sort of tried to group them together. So for example, care at the end of life uh, includes things like assistance with goals of care, but it also includes issues surrounding brain death. And again, New York City has a large Orthodox Jewish population. So we uh, actually not infrequently have consultations regarding questions related to brain death, um, medical futility, uh, uh, unnecessary care. There were a number of consultations, especially later in that eight week period on uh, whether whether uh, teams needed to perform CPR for patients who were already maximally resuscitated, if you will, uh, intubated on multiple pressors. Uh, but all of those sorts of questions come together into this category of care at the end of life, uh, end of life decision making. And then of course there's conflict. Uh, there was a, a, a probably more conflict than normal because as others have dis described, families were not allowed to come into the hospitals and that created a lot of um, concern that perhaps loved ones weren't going to get the ventilator or they weren't going to get the best care. Uh, things that have been described in the media, we would all often hear from family members uh, these questions of, of uh, resource allocation and a lot of concern that their loved ones would not be receiving standard of care. Uh, capacity and treatment over objection is sort of a, a perennial question in our hospital. We uh, tend to have also a relatively large homeless population and a population with mental health, um, mental illnesses. And so that, that often raises these questions of capacity that ethics gets drawn into and then a cat kind of a catch-all category. So I just want to pivot very quickly uh, to this image. Uh, it's an etching by the Italian artist Luigi Sabatelli. And Sabatelli, if you can see in the Italian at the bottom, it says the plague of Florence as described by Boccaccio. So Sabatelli was an artist that lived in the late 1700s and early 1800s. But the scene that he is describing was written about by the humanist and the philosopher, the writer, the thinker, uh, Giovanni Boccaccio, who lived in the 1300s. And um, this is a scene, we are outside the walls of Florence during the bubonic plague. And I know Lori Zoloth ended the last, uh, the last panel talking about the bubonic plague outbreak in the 1600s. And here we are in the 1300s, outside of the walls of Florence, and you can see in the foreground, middle to slightly to the right, there's a heap of corpses, a mass of dead bodies. And uh, there's a, a guy with something that looks like a gurney. It may be a funeral beer. He's adding more corpses to the mass. And in the background, you can see some men with pickaxes. Um, they are presumably waiting uh, to bury the dead. And so this is a scene, th this was a time in history when historians estimate that perhaps as many as two thirds of the population died. And it prompted a real reckoning with the need to prepare well for death. And that has been sort of one of the themes of my own scholarly work. And in fact, uh, led to uh, my, my, both of my books. But this one most recently, the manuscript for which I completed a year before the pandemic started. Uh, but this book takes as a foil the bubonic plague outbreak of the mid-1300s, which prompted a whole genre of literature on the preparation for death. And it asks how we might prepare for death today. And I think, you know, in this moment of uh, a surge nationwide, uh, the, the coronavirus sort of, uh, you know, reeling out of control, but also the hope of a vaccine, uh, we have to think all of us are still going to at some point die. And so uh, taking, taking what we know, what we have learned in the last eight months, the hope for a vaccine, but also knowing that there is no magic bullet and at the same time staying sober and remembering that all of us, uh, all of us want to die well. And in order to die well, we really have to live well. And so living well requires a certain amount of intentionality. And that's what, um, that's what I'm encouraging us all to think about. So I'm going to end my remarks because I'm out of time and I look forward to the panel. Thanks so much. All right. Well, that was a fantastic uh, talk, Dr. Dugdale, and um, really seems like, while not technically under crisis standard of care, that you know Columbia, New York was right on the brink. Um, 
So I am going to start to moderate the panel discussion now. Um, if you can look at, if you've been looking through the questions and upvote ones you want us to address, um, we will we will dive right in. But um, I wanted to ask, I guess starting starting with Dr. Dugdale, uh, a question about um, that I had about CPR and the issues of you know when CPR peers medically futile because the patient's on maximum ICU support. Um, whether or not your response to those, the consults change given the enormous um, strain on resources you had at your hospital. Yeah, great question. Thank you. So New York state law holds that if a patient or family insists on uh, medical technology, that we have to continue that. Uh, there is a very subtle caveat, but it is so complicated that our legal counsel has advised us, essentially, if a family wants full core press, that's what we do. So that's essentially the, uh, the practice. Now, in the Washington Post, there was an article during the height of the pandemic in New York City that uh, uh, NYU's emergency room had unilater unilaterally decided that they would not do CPR on COVID patients. Those of us at Columbia felt like that was not, we, we couldn't have done that, that we didn't have the freedom to do that. Having said that, um, there, there is a way in which we, we saw the maximally resuscitated patient as being a patient who would not benefit from chest compressions uh, should the heart stop, right? So patient maxed out on pressors intubated in the ICU, if that patient's heart were to stop, you know, doing some chest compressions is not going to, uh, going to give this person a shot at life. And so the hospital uh, legal counsel did give us permission to um, not to authorize uh, uh, foregoing that, um, but to give teams essentially the discretion to make a decision. That was a very, very narrow slice of time when that was actually uh, authorized. So for the rest of the time, yeah, we uh, we were so, resuscitating. Yeah, I mean, to use Mark, Mark's four box model, you know, that's a situation where CPR arguably is not medically indicated, right? So it's sort of irrelevant whether or not there's a COVID-19 pandemic, but I think a lot of hospitals all of a sudden, because of this contextual feature of the pandemic, thought, okay, now it's all right to do unilateral DNRs for situations like you described, which I think was sort of a, you know, the, the logic there doesn't totally follow, right? The rationale for foregoing CPR in that patient is equivalent to whether or not they had COVID-19. Um, but, you know, the, the same thing happened at Northwestern. They had, they, they, they had a different interpretation of the state law in Illinois and would, would always code patients, um, but change their policy during the pandemic. Now they're deciding whether to ro roll it back or not. It sounds like you guys already rolled back on the- uh, Well, so the ethicists window. have a, yeah, and the ethicists <laughs> have a different view than the legal counsel, right? But we're sort of, we're bound by the counsel. I'll just say briefly that there was a period of time when Governor Cuomo did give authorization to EMS, uh, to first responders and, and ambulances, not to resuscitate patients they thought were COVID positive. And there was a massive, massive backlash and he quickly rescinded that executive order. So the, the sort of ethos in New York state is it's, you know, people first and you don't necessarily trust the establishment. And, um, and so we err on the side of life. Interestingly, it's a, um, yeah. Uh, Dr. Turkey, how about you at Indiana in CPR? Was there? Yeah, I mean, I, a couple of points I will make is that I think from an ethical point of view, there genuinely is a difference in terms of the risk to clinicians in performing CPR on patients with COVID that was especially acute when PPE was very limited and hard to get your hands on. Um, you know, our um, we do not have such a strict state law, although our practice is generally um, that we have a very complex um, procedure for overriding patient or family preferences regarding both code status and withdrawal of life sustaining treatment. And I would just say that in practice, that was changed somewhat. Um, the DNR thing was changed actually with the um, kind of explicit blessing of our leadership um, that we, we could be, um, we could make unilateral DNR decisions. But I saw it even go beyond that. 
And I think that was um, you know, the part of the case that I presented that I feel the most concerned about. Um, and I, you know, um, that that's, that change in practice was um, you know, something that wasn't discussed in an open forum or carefully thought out, but, but just sort of occurred. Um, and I, I really think it's time to take a pause and think seriously about the right way to proceed um, while, we have, while we have a chance to do that. Yeah, no, it's a serious, I think the overuse or overstretching the scenarios where um, a CPR is not medically indicated, right? Um, that's a very kind of tricky clinical judgment. Even, you know, we can describe the scenario that they're maxed out on pressors and it clearly won't work. But a lot of times as a critical care physician, it's a lot more gray, right? And so we found, we saw pretty a lot of heterogeneity in the implementation of DNR orders for COVID patients in our ICU, um, unsurprisingly, uh, for that reason. And though, and I think it is an area that should bear further discussion. You know, I would add that, you know, now with, with full PPE, we know that the risk to providers is near zero. You know, if you're wearing your N95 half mask, you're fine. But, you know, at the time, at the beginning, we didn't, right? So it's, it's interesting how that part of the ethics calculation. Uh, anybody else want anything to add on that point in particular before I move on to the, the questions here? I would just say that um, uh, for ethics consultation, uh, Lydia, um, you're really in new, new territory. And you, it sounds to me like you've been able to negotiate it really well. The tension between ethics consultants and hospital attorneys has always been there in ethics consultation, but it's often been more of an alliance than a um, than an adversarial relationship. And so I'm sad to hear that uh, the clinical judgment in ethics consultation has been so effectively challenged by your um, hospital attorneys and and hemmed in really by the state law, um, uh, because that's, it, it, it wasn't often the case when I was doing a lot more of that. Um, and, and as Will was saying, I wonder if, you know, when you're addressing goals of care, you're, as I'm sure you are, since you've had such good training, um, uh, looking at not just will it work immediately, but will it work for discharging the patient to uh, from the hospital in healthy condition. Yeah, John, if I can just reply really quickly. Um, so I don't I don't mean to misrepresent the relationship between ethics and the legal counsel. I think we work together very well. But the state, the state of New York has some pretty um, you know, strong feelings about this. And I'll just say during the height of the pandemic, the ethicists were meeting daily uh with with the hospital legal um in part because it was such a moving target there were new executive orders we had a couple of different orders that did give retroactive protections to healthcare workers sort of a an expansion of the good samaritan law if you will uh so that healthcare workers knew that even if it was crisis standards of care they would be protected but we were never given a sort of a permission to unilaterally withdraw DN, uh, withdraw life support. There was zero permission for that. And so the hospital legal understood very much the situation on the ground. They were very responsive, but we were bound by the state. And I, I think that uh, Governor Cuomo, honestly, I think that Governor Cuomo, even though it felt that he, he wasn't budging at the time, I think he was wise. Because while there were a couple of hospitals that really, really got pummeled for a couple of weeks. Uh, I do think the New York Times sort of over-dramatized everything that was happening in New York, and a lot of us yeah. felt that way. Um, huh. So it wasn't, it was really bad for a couple of weeks, um, and a couple of hospitals particularly bad. Our smaller hospital, the Allen, was pretty bad uh, for a couple of weeks. Yeah. But, uh, but we didn't run out of ventilators, um, and if we would have been given permission to start pulling people off of machines, I do think we would have contributed to deaths that did not end up happening because of the pandemic. So, uh, you know, uh, I think the, all of these things we have to approach with humility and sobriety and move slowly and err on the side of life. And I do believe there's wisdom there. 
Hmm. Great. Thanks so much. Well, I think we could talk about New York for the rest of the time, but I wanted to shift to some, we got some really good questions about uh, Professor uh, Milani's work. Um, in particular, a uh, couple of people asked, do you see any applications of your study of India's response to COVID-19 to the US? And I had a very specific question about the idea of using an instrument to potentially estimate unbiased estimates of COVID-19 uh, prevalence in various populations, maybe like a small, you know, financial um, award for getting tested. Yeah. Uh, okay. So um, uh, I think there's, here, I'll, I'll tell you the few things. First is one of the reasons why um, I focused on India almost exclusively during this epidemic uh, was the sense that I got from talking to colleagues of mine that got involved in U.S. policymaking were, was that it was very difficult. It was a very political environment here in a way that it wasn't in India. Uh, and so that it made it very hard to have an open discussion about different approaches to handling the pandemic without people making judgments about that. So you could actually get a full airing of what's going on. Um, uh, and so that's one of the reasons I worked there. I, I think that that would be a lesson for us to bring back here is I think that there was just a huge amount of uncertainty at the beginning. Uh, and if at the beginning we were just a little bit more uh, modest about what we knew and didn't uh, jump down each other's throats. Uh, I think that we, I think we probably would have seen, maybe would have seen a lot more stuff. I uh, would have been able to analyze the data a little bit uh, better. I think that's nice. It's something that we did in India a little bit more. Uh, it did help to have some distance. I'm sitting in Chicago, the work's being done there or in Jakarta. A second thing that I think was very interesting uh, is that there was a ton of uh, uh, collaboration in, on the private sector side. And I think that part of that happened because we thought that there would be less capacity on the government. So we organized a task force of, uh, you know, kind of heads of different types of industries, so a bunch of CEOs, civil sector, uh, civil society organizations, World Bank, et cetera, all got together to basically, and plugged in with government officials to kind of help them wherever uh, things were needed. And so there's was, there was this sense of collaboration uh, that I think would have been would have been probably a little bit nicer here. The third thing is there's a lot more stuff that happens informally in India. Uh, so in some ways we're very slow to test, but on the other hand, we've done a lot of zero surveys. And I compare that to my colleagues that have gone through a really rough time getting zero surveys out, representing surveys out. There are ethical issues, there's issues about approval of the tests, there are just issues about recruitment, there's liability issues. We worry about very little of that in India, so we're able to act a lot more quickly. Um, the last thing is, you know, um, uh, uh, we're able to just kind of have open discussions about vaccine priorities. Not everybody's going to listen to us, uh, but at least we're thinking about it. Uh, and we're taking, at least when I say we, I mean, folks that are uh, working with India and Indonesia are taking like the limited supply stuff very seriously and understand that there's just tough trade-offs and they're not uh, really, it's not as big a deal. Um, on paying people to get consent. It's something that actually a group of researchers at Chicago have been thinking about. People like, uh, you might be working with them, like Alex Torgovitsky and Magne Mokstad and and, uh, and, and Vinny Vandy. Um, and the difficulty has been, it's just very hard to get approval for that sort of stuff in the United States. Um, uh, we tried to do that when we did the Karnataka study at the beginning. And the thing that stopped us wasn't the ethical review. Uh, and, and just to be clear, I was involved just as a, in a public health capacity in doing that stuff. I, I only see the data at the back end. Uh, uh, but um, in that context, when we suggested this as a design, it wasn't the government that was opposed to it. It was the survey that was going out to doing a lot of the work, was worried that this would kind of uh, create an expectation of payment. So they didn't want to do it. But we are, uh, we were able to gather data on people that didn't consent and people that did consent. So we're able to see what the impact uh, of consent is. And so now we're working on that topic now to see if we're getting real bias due to consent. Yeah, thanks. I did hear about that from uh, Magne when I took his econometrics class in the spring. So or I survived it barely. But um, <laughs> so yeah, no, it's a very interesting, you know, idea with vaccines in particular, which you said about examining sort of even the WHO things that have come out uh, from a perspective of, you know, how much benefit to the overall population is vaccinating healthcare workers first um, going to achieve, right? Obviously, you're protecting a very important workforce from getting sick in the community. But now that we know that with proper PPE, the risk is pretty low of getting infected, maybe vaccinating high-risk populations would actually save more lives. So 
you know, hopefully there's still time in the U.S. and the world before we distribute the vaccine to sort of very carefully allocate this scarce resource to, to save the most people. And then, you know, yep. you know, with the added dimension of whether you want lives or life years, like you mentioned. I also want to point out there's just fundamentally something different in the United States than these LMICs, low and middle income countries. In the U.S., when I just compare their two, two situations, we live in prosperity. That sounds weird to say in this context, but I don't think there's any question that we're going to have enough doses for everybody. It's just a question of pure distribution. Whereas for a lot of other countries, it's the distribution is also there, but they also are not getting the doses that they need to cover a large percentage of the population. Another super interesting thing that goes on in India that's a strong ethical issue, I had a converse, long conversation about this earlier today, is if we take our Karnataka work seriously and we think that we're at 46% prevalence in Karnataka, uh, and that's probably an underestimate because we're doing zero studies rather than looking at T-cell assays, we're doing that next in, in Bangalore. You know, what if you find that by January, February, 75% of the population is already exposed in one area and 40% in another area? Do we want to then say we're going to prioritize the 40% area because that's where it's going to be a bigger impact and mm -hmm. let the 70%, you know, they've kind of got natural immunity. And I want to be careful about herd immunity because I think that there's a reason to go beyond it sometimes because there's still value to reducing the rate of, of spread, even even though the rate of spread is less than one. Uh, but that those sorts of issues occur and you are more likely to make those sorts of decisions in a world where you've got severe supply restraints. India is actually in a much better situation because it produces vaccines than Indonesia, but Indonesia is going to face that quite severely, as well as other countries in that same boat. Well, it's certainly sobering to think of how relatively lucky we are. Oh yeah, go ahead. Um, sorry, Lydia. We're speaking before, would you consider uh, payment for testing uh, sort of, would that be similar to you can't do your job unless you get a test? Isn't that a sort of a different sort of uh, payment? Like we'll give you your paycheck if you get a test. Yeah. I know yeah. it's just required it. Our ID badges won't work if we aren't tested. They're going to just a, cut us really, off from work. That's a really great point. I mean, I think we are very often being ethically inconsistent. So we're happy to tell students they have, if they want to come back to campus, they got to get tested. But we don't want to say, uh, on the other hand, and that's a penalty, by the way, because they they've already given you the money and they're ready to come. Uh, but then we weren't, we're, we're uncomfortable saying, let's pay people to, to participate in human challenge trials. And we're only, by the way, having that discussion in the context of vaccines. Even before a vaccine, we could have had an ethical, uh, a really interesting ethical discussion in April and say, should we just have human challenge trials to learn about the epidemiology of, of, of COVID so that we can provide medical, med better medical protocols for treating patients? Had a, would have had a huge impact, uh, worldwide benefit, because there's tons of scale associated with that. It seems like a good question, and we've kind of violated that principle if we had it later on. We do that now with our students. So I think that's a great question. <laughs> well, it's always fun to hear you write everything down in terms of a utility function. Um, so I think we should probably, get, I should probably read some of these um, questions from the, from the chat directly. Uh, John Lantos asks, Lydia, people talk of crisis standards of care. Were there crisis standards of ethics? Did you make different recommendations than in non-COVID times? Hi, John. Thanks. Um, so not not really i mean with the exception of at the end of the worst part of the pandemic uh changing our thinking if you will on what is maximal resuscitation that was that was really it for us we did draw up a number of of policies that were not adopted or enacted so that's what i've got all right um the next one is um, from Kelly who asked me, given what you know, how would you structure critical care scarce resource allocation policies? What would the primary ethical driver be? Um, so I don't, I guess, um, I don't totally, I haven't totally decided I wanna do better modeling with more data, but I think I'm gravitating more and more towards just pure lottery systems because in the US, you would think any absolute scarcity in a given place would hopefully be brief, right? You know, it sounds like Columbia was right up against the point where they were thinking about it in New York. And, you know, in order to get these efficiency gains with the SOFA system, um, they're minor, first of all, over lottery in our simulations, you have to create significant disparities among 
uh, you know, racial lines and against people with chronic con <clears throat> conditions. So maybe it's best that if you're only going to be out of ICU beds for a short period of time, that you that the, the principle of treating people equally dominates and you just allocate by a simple uh, lottery. Now, it's hard to tease out, like, isn't there a first come first serve and that intrinsically because people have to get in the line to get in, in to get into the lottery in the first place. But at least, you know, you make um, progress towards uh, distributing the resource fairly, if not the most efficiently. And I should say, I didn't get a chance at the end of my slides to thank Lainey Ross, who is my, uh, you know, uh, along with Mark, my main mentor over the years in thinking about scarce resource allocation really got me started in this area. So thanks, Lainey, if you're still listening. Um, I don't know if any other people have thoughts about, you know, if you could design a scarce resource allocation, critical care resource allocation system, if we're if that's where we're headed. Um, you know, if you if you thought any of the state protocols were uh, compelling or or what? So I, I have a, a interesting that so I actually emailed you separately about this based upon your presentation, which is when you use these lottery systems, there's this kind of weird spillover benefit, which is that you can learn about the efficacy of the treatment uh, uh, when you do that. And it's, it, it seems kind of weird to, to, to talk about it that way, but there's actually discussion now by folks like Alex Tabarrok and, and Scott Commoners saying that we ought to think about that for vaccines. So if we have limited supply of vaccines, what if we distribute it by lottery? Uh, not only is there a fairness benefit, but we actually as a society benefit because we can learn about uh, the efficacy of the vaccine or side effects from the vaccine in a large population. Um, and so I, I think it's a really interesting question uh, about whether or not, uh, I think there are a lot of benefits to the approach you're taking. I'll just say that, oh, are you talking well? Can't hear you. I think you're muted. Well, maybe while, Will, are you getting your sound? Okay, I'll just talk for a quick second. Um, uh, the, the one thing that really struck us, so our, you know, John Lantos, our contingency plan was sort of something, modif you know, modified version of SOFA and triaging based on that. And what we realized, because we weren't allowed to enact any of those sort of emergency plans, we realized that there were patients whose SOFA score, based on their SOFA scores, we should have removed the vent if, we, if it had come to that and we needed the ventilator. And they ended up surviving to discharge. So what we found with COVID is that the patient, it, it just didn't make sense. It didn't make sense on how we understood uh, previous viral illnesses. We were constantly surprised. We were constantly surprised by very elderly people who would go out with trachs and pegs and then come to follow-up visits. Uh, later, having had, you know, the devices removed and they were sort of back, it took months uh, to recover, but we were constantly surprised. And that's why, well, I do, I, I guess I've become more nervous about using those kinds of, um, those kinds of protocols, such as SOFA. Uh, I know you're still trying to talk, Will, and we still can't hear you. But at any rate, I do like the idea of the lottery. I, I'm moving towards that myself. You should speak. You should speak. Can, I in? can you hear me at all? I can hear Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? I, 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 I'd like to just say a, a quick word to, to thank your panel. Um, it, it was a fabulous group. Um, uh, I mean, Will and, and John and Lexi and Lydia and Anoop. Um, I have one thing that I wanted to say, and that is that John LaPuma was the first fellow that we trained at the McLean Center in July of 20, uh, July of 1985. Uh, we had opened the McLean Center in December of 84, and John was number one fellow trained. He was the only fellow that year. Um, uh, and. Um, so I just wanted to announce that. I, I'd, I'd like to say a quick word about tomorrow morning. <laughs> who, who mentioned Lainey Ross uh, just a minute ago? Uh, Will did. Yeah. Um, Lainey Ross is going to be moderating the morning panel at 8 o'clock in the morning on pediatric ethics 
Um, the, um, the speakers will be Mark Sheldon uh, of Northwestern, Megan Collins from Hopkins, Laney herself, uh, Rick Kodish from Cleveland, and John Lantos from Missouri. So that, that'll be on pediatric ethics, and that'll be before the dean comes on, uh, D Dean Polanski, uh, with the award presentation. Um, but I, I wanted to congratulate your group and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Will. Bye, Anu. Thank you. John. We should say that the, the um, award presentation tomorrow after the first panel is to Mark. And, uh, <laughs> and the, the McLean Center Prize is one that not only he initiated, but he gets. And uh, that in itself is an accomplishment. But that, now but, you know, I don't get, I don't get the money. Everybody else before why? me. <laughs> oh no, what happened? <laughs> because, I, because I'm a University of Chicago faculty member. And so oh my God. the, the $50,000 prize that has gone to all previous winners is not going. <laughs> oh, <laughs> can't we can't you take a leave of absence for a day? <laughs> 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 I'm delighted and honored to, to get the prize uh, without the money, that's fine. Uh, but uh, well, we we really look I, forward to your remarks, Mark, and and it it will be a a, a wonderful wonderful occasion. And, and I, I, um, I will I will give remarks afterwards. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. I I really I really appreciate it. Thanks so much to your committee and to Will. Thanks, guys. Bye bye. Good. Well, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye now.